personal privilege, as it were. Uh, just let's take about 30 seconds to a minute to pray for the preaching of God's Word. You'll take your Bibles now and turn to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 3. I'd like to send, send greetings to those who are watching online. I know Rebecca and her family are watching, uh, Floyd and Gigi, uh, the Dobbins, uh, the Saunders, and others who are joining us online. May God bless you today as you hear the Word and as we celebrate the Word of God together. We hear a lot today the phrase or the refrain, that's not right, or that's not just. You know, the Bible says that he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. It's an abomination, the Bible says, to condemn the righteous, and it's an abomination to, uh, to, uh, to, to justify the wicked. And justice. Justice is something we hear a lot about. Justice is based on the idea of equity. Equity means that the punishment, in, in, when it comes to justice, means that the punishment fits the crime. If someone burns down your house, it's not just for them to have a $50 fine. And we know this. We know this intrinsically. If someone murders your child, it's not just for them to just spend a week in jail. And we know this. So we understand the concepts of justice and, and injustice and equity. We understand these concepts intrinsically. And yet, again and again we hear, how could God be just and yet send anyone to hell? Or even worse, we hear, I won't serve a God who is so unjust as to send anyone to hell. Now against these common and frankly ignorant accusations, the Bible actually asks the opposite question. The Bible asks the question, 
How could God be just and yet send anyone to heaven? In fact, if God did not do something about the injustice of passing over sins without punishing them, the Bible demonstrates that he would not only not be just, but he would not be God at all. And by the end of this sermon from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31, I hope you will see that God's judgment is just, and that he is not only loving, but he is just, not only when he punishes people for their sins, but he's actually just when he forgives sinners. Hear the word of God. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and following. I'll read from the ESV today. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Amen. This is the reading of God's holy word. Let's pray. Now, Father, as we look at this uh, very deep uh, section of Scripture, we pray that you would open our minds and hearts that we might truly receive the word, that we might receive it with thanksgiving, with with faith and with love. Help us and teach us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing that, that we see here in this passage is that all have sinned. I think that's something that would jump out at, at us in this passage. Romans uh, chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and, uh, and all are guilty before God. Now, someone might say, well, wait a minute, I haven't, I haven't committed any crimes against God. I haven't done anything that would deserve His punishment? Well, it, it, it's, uh, it, that's, that's actually not true because uh, the Bible teaches that, uh, that sin is lawlessness. Sin itself is lawlessness. So when people say, well, I haven't broken any of God's laws, or I'm not a lawbreaker, or I'm not guilty before God, I'm a pretty good person, we have to, we have, to have them read chapters 1 and 2 and 3 of Romans, as we've been doing for the last few months. Uh, because then you see that that sin, so the, the shorter catechism says, what is sin? And the answer is sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. So these are what would be called sins of omission or sins of commission. So a sin of commission is breaking his law. A sin of omission is not doing what he's commanded, just simply being passive and not doing what he's commanded. And sin is anything that either transgresses his law or that fails to obey him. Now you think about that uh, when John chapter one, uh, John, first John chapter three verse one says, "Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness." So there is the biblical definition of sin. Sin is lawlessness. So the Bible says, do this, and you say, no, I'm going to do that. That is lawlessness. It's not just sin as a concept. It is that God as a lawgiver has given us laws. And when we don't uh, follow his laws, we are lawless. We are now lawbreakers in God's eyes. And everybody has done that. Uh, you know, if you, again, as we look many times, we think about the Ten Commandments and we think about, is there anybody who has ever lived that could say that they have perfectly obeyed 
the Ten Commandments? And the answer is no. Is there anyone who could uh, ever say that they have always perfectly, or even, well, anyone who has obeyed the two great commandments? Jesus says, uh, when he's asked what is the greatest commandment in the law, he says this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. Meaning that whatever attention you give to your profession, you should give more to the Word of God. Whatever attention uh, and, and study that you give to any subject, you, could, you should give more to the Word of God and to how God is working in your profession because, uh, because God is the God of all knowledge. Whatever affection you give to your spouse or to your children, you should give more to God. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your inward being, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Just by, by the way, uh, you don't have to wait on a social construct in order to love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to help your neighbor, you are free to do that right now. You don't have to wait for the government to impose some sort of equal sharing plan in order to start helping your neighbor. You're free to do that right now. But the fact is nobody uh, loves their neighbor as themselves perfectly and perpetually. So all of us have broken. Uh, and nobody loves the Lord our God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength perfectly and perpetually. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so sin is lawlessness. And because all have sinned, all are therefore based on their works, guilty and deserving of punishment, not innocent and deserving of heaven. So again, the Bible never asks the question, how can God be just and send anyone to hell? The Bible again and again brings us to this question, how can God be just? How can he be righteous and send anyone to heaven? So there should be some tension and some unrest with this idea that God could be both just, but that he wouldn't even think about pardoning the wicked. It would be like a man who comes into the... We're shaking it up here a little bit. We're sitting in different places today. Okay, I like this. you got to keep me on my toes. All right. So, so it would be like a man who has been convicted of murder, and he's sitting in the courtroom, and the judge is even thinking about letting him go. Even to think about it ought to be a scandal and ought to be uncomfortable, but that's what God is doing in Scripture. He is claiming to be just, and yet He is proposing that sinners who are lawbreakers could be forgiven. It is a scandalous idea on the surface. There's no scandal in God punishing people for their sins and sending them to hell. No scandal at all. That's just doing the right thing. That's just righteous. So when you see riots and outrage about injustice, I want you to remember this is a reflection of the outrage of how wrong it is for something evil to happen and there be no punishment. For the wicked to be justified. Now, our culture ought to be outraged that they have done evil sight of God, and yet he has not acted to strike them all dead, all of us dead, in the moment, and to send everyone to hell. Where is the justice? Where is the justice in God not immediately punishing not just their sin, but ours? That ought to be the burning question and the sense of outrage that every human feels, that we could sin against a holy and righteous and perfectly just God. In fact, if we could just take the outrage that we would feel about someone stealing from us, burning our house down, murdering our friend or our family member, and we could just take that outrage that we would feel about them and we could mitigate it towards us as though we were the culprit, as though we had assaulted our neighbor, burned down our neighbor's house, murdered our neighbor's child, and now we must face justice in a court of law. then we would be closer 
to the conundrum that humans are in before a holy God. Because all have sinned. All have broken God's law. Jesus says if you've hated your neighbor, if you've hated your neighbor, you're a murderer in your heart. If you've looked at a woman with lust, or ladies, if you've looked at a man with lust, you have committed adultery in your heart. And the heinousness of our sin, it doesn't, it doesn't stop there. The heinousness of our sin is compounded based on the dignity of the person that is offended. This is something we go over in the membership class. So, so people say, well, I haven't sinned in a big way. I haven't sinned in a big way, so God should, should, shouldn't give me uh, hell. You know, I shouldn't have to go to hell. Well, actually, uh, <laughs> according to Anselm, and he was right, and he, when he wrote for Deus Homo, imagine that the person that you assaulted or the person that you stole from or the person that you burned down the house of was not just your neighbor, but he was the, the mayor of your town or the governor of your state. Or even worse, what if, what if this person was a Supreme Court justice and you have to stand before this person and be judged? Yeah, somebody says, oh. Yeah, you see, it's not just that you've sinned against somebody that is your equal. You've sinned against someone who has a higher office than you. If, 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 uh, the illustration I often give is, you know, if, if I steal Walt's wallet, I don't, not, don't always pick on Walt, but if I steal his wallet, I might get a fine. Probably not going to see jail time. Maybe I will see a few days or something. But if I stole the governor's wallet, or if I stole the president's wallet, or if I stole the Supreme, uh, Supreme Court Justice's wallet, I'm going to do a lot more time and have a lot more severe punishment for the same crime because of the dignity of the person according to their office. So God has an infinite value. He, you, you cannot put a value. You could, you could put a, an equitable punishment on the crimes that I just talked about. You could say, well, you know, if you steal a, the wallet of a Supreme Court Justice, it's it, 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 you know, you deserve 10 years or 20 years in jail. And, and people will say, yeah, that's fair. Okay, that's fair. But if you steal or if you assault or commit a crime against a being of infinite value, there is no limit to the equitable punishment that you need to receive because you offended a being of infinite value. And that is why hell is eternal. That's why. Sin is not a light thing. And, and to add to it, the one that you've offended is the one who will judge you. He's the one that will pronounce a verdict to which no one can answer. He is the final authority to which there is no appeal. That's the situation that people are in. And he is righteous. And he is, he is just. And he must punish iniquity because those who don't punish iniquity are an abomination to him. He who justifies the wicked or, 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 or pardons the righteous are, are both an abomination. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both an abomination to the Lord. Now, people don't realize this only because they don't see God face to face yet but the instant they stand before God. We were, we were uh, sitting around in the living room yesterday, uh, me and, me and uh, Heather and the kids, and, uh, and, and, and one of the kids was petting our dog, and there was a sunbeam that was illuminating the dog, and there was all this dust and hair flying everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and we wouldn't have seen that apart from the light, apart from the light that was coming in. You know, we pet the dog all the time, and we don't notice any, any of this, but it was just this big cloud of hair and dust and all this. And it's always there, but you only see it in the light. When you stand in the perfect light of God's judgment, your sins will be, and the sins of all humanity and each and every one will be illuminated like never before. And you won't be able to pretend that they're not there or that you had better motives or there. make any excuse. The light of God's uh, presence will reveal the horror and heinousness of our sin. And this is what happened to Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah was a good man. He was a good man. And yet when he stood in the presence of God, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up in Isaiah chapter 6, he says this. He says, I am undone. 
a man of unclean lips who dwells among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. He says, woe to me. He pronounces a curse upon himself, as Dr. Sproul pointed out uh, so eloquently. If you've never heard him preach from chapter 6, you should, of Isaiah. So Isaiah sees God and he, pronounced, he himself condemns himself. And he knows that only God can save him and only God can, can, uh, can purify that which is unclean. And God does. It's an awesome chapter. I'm tempted to preach from it, but I'm, I'm going to move on. Verse 25 in Romans 3 says something very interesting, very, very interesting. It says that, that God did something. He, he sent Jesus Christ as a propitiation by his blood. We'll talk about that in a minute. And it says this was to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Meaning, there were sinners in the Old Testament. Christ had not been crucified yet. God had been patient and he had, he had in his divine forbearance not punished their sins. That is a display of God's patience. Because God could, if he had wanted to, he could have, the moment we sin one time, he could send us to hell forever because of the infinite uh, crime that we've committed, the infinite value of the crime that we've committed, and he doesn't do that. And he didn't do that to Abraham. When Abraham was a coward and let his wife be taken into another man's tent. Uh, he, he didn't do that with David, when David committed adultery with Bathsheba. He didn't do it. He could have, but he didn't. And so now Paul is wrestling with this idea of how can God be just? How can he be righteous if he has not punished their sins? The Bible says it was divine forbearance. And the best I could come up with is this, as, as an analogy. I want you to imagine that your neighbor is attempting to destroy your reputation and your property. He speaks against you to others. He starts rumors about you. He does underhanded things to you that, that, that are to your detriment. And on top of this, he sneaks into your yard at night and he poisons all your crops. And, and that which does grow, he, he, he corrupts by releasing a, a dozens of pests, rabbits and, and squirrels and things into your garden so that they destroy the rest of your crop and you're ruined. And you know it's him. You end up with like 1% of your normal harvest. But because you're merciful and patient, you not only don't destroy him, but you actually send him a gift from what remains of your harvest. That would mean you're a really, what? You're a really patient person. Really patient. And very gracious. Do you realize that is what God is doing every single time the sun rises? The Bible says that he makes the sun shine on the righteous and the wicked. He, he makes the sun shine and he sends the rain and he, and he gives you food and houses and clothing and, and friends and enjoyments all the while the unbeliever ignores him. He uses his creation to their own ends and for their own glory, never thinking about what God demands and yet he continues to be patient and he continues to give gifts and he continues to be gracious. Divine forbearance. Notice what modifies forbearance. It's not just patience. It's not just forbearance. It is divine forbearance because I'm going to tell you something. People are quick to give accusations to God. If any one of us were God, we wouldn't put up with it for a second. Not for a second. To be so gracious and so loving and so generous to humanity and humanity thumbs their nose at you when all this was for you anyway? No, no. <laughs> we would not put up with the abuse that God endures for a second. The blasphemous things that are said about him out of mouths that he created. God is so patient. He is the most patient being in existence. He is the most gracious being in existence. And, and he is divinely patient. <laughs> Much more patient than any of us would be. So anytime someone accuses God, they should really take a look at how they deal with other people and see if they meet the standard of their own accusation. 
The Bible continues in verse, uh, verse 24. It says that we're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Not by works. Not by works. By grace. Not by works. We've talked about this a lot in Romans. Uh, you know, it, again, if you were standing before the bench of the Supreme Court and the justices, the nine justices are looking at you and you have committed crimes against one or all of them, perhaps. And you say, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I did some charity. I, I did some good work. I, I know I burned down your house, uh, but I've also, I've also uh, you know, uh, given to the Crisis Pregnancy Center. How do you think that's going to go? It's not going to go very well. It's actually an insult to think that you could make up for your crimes based on doing something good, as though your crimes now should not be punished. That's why we can only be saved by grace, not by our works. We cannot make up for the wrong that we've done. There is no way to undo any sin. There's no way. Sins must be paid for, and we can't pay because we're, we're broke. We have no righteousness with which to pay for our sins. How many have fallen and uh, how many have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? All, every one. This is why Galatians 2.16 says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. The function of the law is not to justify you. It's not what it's for. He goes on and he talks about how this justification that we're going to touch on in just a second is not just for the Jew, but for the Gentile. It's for anyone who would throw themselves upon the mercy of God and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's based only on God's predeterminate counsel, his unmerited favor, his grace. In, in the strictest sense of the word. Ephesians chapter 1 verse, verse 5 and following it says this. After talking about how, how serious our situation was. It says he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace. That he would forgive us. That he would adopt us who were enemies. Yes, it's to the praise of His glorious grace. We, we look at God and the angels look at God and they say, how glorious is His grace. Now they only say that because He's also solved the equity problem that we're going to talk about in a minute. To the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in, in Christ, in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. This was his will, the counsel of his will. Nobody advised him. Ephesians 2, 8, uh, 8 through 10, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. So that no one may boast. And this is, this, is, this, this is the same thing that our text says. It says boasting is excluded. If we are saved by faith, if we are saved by grace, boasting is excluded. We, we cannot boast that we are saved, except that we boast in the cross of Christ. So, so what I'm saying is we can't, we can't look down on others and boast as though we have done some great thing. We have done nothing except receive the grace of God. My favorite illustration of this was from uh, one of the first expositional preachers I ever listened to, a guy named Tom Nelson, who uh, was in Texas. Uh, he was a Texas boy, as he would say. And uh, <clears throat> Tom Nelson said, you know, uh, he, he gave this illustration. He said, he said when I was a teenager... He said, I worked hard. He said, I got a job as soon as I could, and I worked, and I saved my money, and I bought an old truck. And he says, it wasn't pretty, but it was mine. 
And he said, I earned it. And he said, one time me and my, my best friend were at a stoplight and, uh, and up next to us, another boy from our high school rolls up and he's in a Ferrari. He was ultra rich. And, uh, and he rolls up and he and his friends are looking over at my, me and my friend in our old truck and, and he's laughing at us. They're laughing at us. And so he said, you know, I was a young, young man and kind of brazen. And he says, I rolled down the window and I, and, and I, and I looked over at him and I said, that's a nice car that your daddy bought. <laughs> and the point, the point is, and he said the, the guy just kind of hung his head and drove off. And the point is that it's foolish to boast when you're the one that was just given the gift. You see that? Gifts speak of the giver, not of the receiver. Which is why Christians should not act boastful because we have done nothing. All we've done is receive. Yes, we drive the Ferrari of God's grace. But we didn't earn it. He gave it. He gave it. So whenever anyone notices the blessings in our life or the grace of God that we have, we point to Him. And we do it gladly with humility. We say, look, I, I did nothing but believe the gospel and He gave me that faith. By grace we've been saved through faith, and that is not of ourselves. It, the faith, and the grace both are the gift of God. So no boasting is allowed. Now, God gave these gifts to us when we were in sin, when we were enemies. The Bible says that, uh, that, that when we were enemies, He gave His Son. And now much more will he, will he love us uh, and will he give us all things now that we are his friends. Romans 8, 7 speaks of the natural condition of man and it says the, man, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God and it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So you hear that. It says the mind that is set on the flesh. That's a perfect description of, of all humanity. The mind that is set on the flesh, that, that just means the mind that is focused on things of the earth, on, on you, what you want, uh, you know, what you're doing, anything but God. The mind that is set on the flesh, it says, is actually hostile towards God. And yet God gives grace and converts people from that condition. He adopts them as his children. <clears throat> So again, Christians, because we've received this as a free gift, we ought to be humble and we ought to be gracious towards others, not haughty and looking down on others. This is why uh, 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, it says, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. Notice this, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. Did you hear that? What's our hope when we engage with other people? Not to belittle them. Not to put them down because they don't have what we have freely received. But to invite them to, to consider the grace of God, correcting his opponents with gentleness. And this really gets into the motivation that's behind witnessing. Do you want people to believe the gospel and be saved, even if they're the most wretched person right now? Do you want that? If you do, now if you just want them to go to hell, don't witness to them. Just don't. If you, if you want somebody to go to hell, keep your mouth shut and don't witness to anybody. That's better than, than witnessing in a mean and demeaning way because that's not witness. To witness is to say, I have nothing. I deserve nothing and God has given me everything because he's gracious and he will do the same for you if you will turn to him and repent. He will love you. He will adopt you. He will accept you. And that's what I want. Correcting his opponents with gentleness. Why? Because if you correct people with harshness, if you get into it with people and you're trying to share the gospel with them, it just, you get the fight or flight response. They just, they, they, they feel backed into a corner and they want to fight. Because you're fighting with them. Instead of as ambassadors making the appeal, be reconciled to says that if you do this, if you correct your opponents with gentleness, even if they drive you crazy, 
Correct them with gentleness. God, not you. You might. It doesn't say you might argue them into the faith. It says God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Repentance is a gift from God. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. So, to, to summarize where we've come uh, so far in this text, the divine conundrum is this. God loved the elect. He loved his people. But they, like all others, deserved damnation because of their sins. And God's decreed solution to this was to satisfy his own divine justice through the cross. Because of the heinousness of our sin, justice, divine justice, demanded the highest price. Look at verses 24 and 25. It says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation through faith in his blood. Why did he do this? To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that were passed through the forbearance or patience, divine patience of God. If you're in that courtroom and you've committed those crimes, or if someone you know is in that courtroom, someone who has committed crimes against you, they've, they've, they've burned down your house, and Ryan wasn't there, and Leo weren't there to help, and your house burned down. And they've, you know, maybe your family member died in that fire or was injured. And now the culprit is there in the court, and the judge says, you know what? Do you want to be forgiven? And the, and, the, and the culprit says, yeah, I want to be forgiven. And the judge says, well, I'm very loving, so you can go. You're free. The cries of injustice and the news articles of injustice, and hopefully you know, maybe even riots of injustice would happen, because that really would be unjust, wouldn't it? For someone to, to commit a crime and to get off scot-free, just because the judge is loving and forgiving is not right. And again, that's the situation that humanity is in. Righteous indignation happens when the punishment doesn't fit the crime. When the punishment is too light or when there is no punishment at all. Can you imagine the, the reaction of the angels if God, without sending Christ, just forgave humanity? Can you imagine their reaction? The angels are the ones who, if they sinned one time, were cast out of heaven forever to be demons, forever separated from God's love, given no grace. And so God's just supposed to forgive humanity? No. You see, this is what the Bible's talking about in this passage of Scripture. If someone in our congregation was murdered, we would not be satisfied if the judge just let the murderer go or if the judge said well yeah you got to do a little bit you know you got to have a 50 dollar fine we would be outraged and rightly so we would demand an equitable price for that murder we demand it we would not rest until we saw it and in a confused way that's what our culture is doing they're they're they're, they're when they riot they're uh, they're saying this is in this is unjust. So they, they understand that you have to understand. They understand, everyone understands these concepts of injustice. The sin nature confuses the facts. But what happens when the barrel of the gun is pointed toward you? What happens when you're the one that stands before the bench and when your sins are unfolded and when there are cries for justice from the courts of heaven? The Bible says that which forms the basis of our forgiveness is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God put him forth as a propitiation in his blood to declare his righteousness. The cross was not just about the love of God, it was about declaring the righteousness of God. Sin had to be punished. It had to be or else God would be unjust. That's what it says in verse 26. To declare his righteousness that he might be just. Have you ever thought about the possibility that God could be unjust? 
The Bible says that the only way that he could both forgive sins and be just was to punish sins in the person of Jesus Christ. And that is in part the gospel. That's part of it. Hebrews 7.22 says that Jesus became an enguos, a surety or a guarantor for us. A surety is uh, when you pay someone else's bond to get them out of jail. You go and you give money and you write your name on a line that says surety. It still says it today. At least it did a few years ago. And what you're saying is, I will pay this fine. I will pay her fine. I will pay it with my own money. Now, the problem is, our fine, our punishment is so big because we have offended an infinite God that there's only one being that can pay our fine. There's only one that has the resources to pay our fine, and it is God. It's God himself. This is why, again, Anselm wrote that brilliant piece of Cur Deus Homo. Why God, man? Why did God have to become a man? And the answer, in short, is because he had to be God in order to pay an infinite price. And he had to be man to pay the price for men and women, for humans. The value of Jesus Christ's blood is inestimable. It is beyond compare. It is beyond comprehension. It is beyond description of value. Uh, in, in a similar way, a much less, lesser way, uh, there, there was a, I was looking at large diamonds. Uh, I wanted to buy one for Heather, but I couldn't, I couldn't afford it. There was one that was 530 carats. It was called the Great Star of Africa. And uh, it, it, in its description, it says it is literally impossible to put a price on this diamond. I thought, yeah, it, it probably is because that's a huge diamond. I don't even know how big that thing would be. It's huge, 530 carats. But let's just say for a minute that I own the Great Star of Africa and I decided not to give it to, to Heather, but rather to exchange it for the chairs in this room. I could do that, right? It wouldn't be a fair exchange necessarily. I mean, the, the value on that diamond would be, in and of itself, it would be beyond estimation. There's no way to ascribe value to it. I could trade that diamond for, for the entirety of the county if I wanted to. But I want the chairs. That's what I want. I want the chairs. So I'm going to exchange the diamond for the price for the chairs. Now, at that point in the exchange, the diamond's absolute value, as it were, has now taken on a transactional value. And so we're going, I'm going to buy the chairs with the diamond. In a similar way, the blood of Jesus Christ is absolutely inestimable. But he shed his blood for us. He shed his blood for us. He bought us with his blood. You know that song, he sought me and he bought me. Yes, there's some deep theology in that song. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. The blood of Christ worth 10,000, 10, thousands of universes. And he shed his blood for his people. This is what it means when it says that he is our surety in Hebrews 7, 22. When we sing the song, before the throne, my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. Jesus Christ uh, took the names that were written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. And he gave his life for them. Even though he was worth so much more than all humanity combined. Far more. And in that exchange that was made, he laid his life down. He bought us with his blood. Uh, he, he, he completely paid for our sins. And he didn't just pay for us, but he paid the penalty that we deserved. That's why it says that he was set forth as a propitiation. Propitiation uh, speaks of a sacrifice that satisfies God's wrath. So there's no more wrath for me and you, brothers and sisters. Christ has fully paid it. He's fully paid it. 
So in 26, which is the last verse I'll talk about today, it says that God did this to declare his righteousness so that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. So you see, the cross, if you think about the horror of the cross, the sinless, spotless Savior, perfect and infinite in value, God himself in the flesh, hanging on the cross, being spat upon, being crushed under the wrath of God, drinking the cup of God's wrath. It's really a commentary on our sin and how horrible our sin really is. And what necessary penalty had to be paid in order for me and you to be forgiven and to be justified. In the cross, we see a glimpse of hell as it were. Because we should have been the ones hanging on that cross and not just hanging on it for a short amount of time, but for all eternity. But when God hangs on the cross, God can pay an infinite price in a finite amount of time because he's of infinite value. So when people diminish their view of hell, they, have, they also diminish their view of the cross. All theology is connected. You cannot discard one doctrine without affecting the others. If you don't think hell is eternal, then that means that you think that Christ paid a lesser price on the cross. Because what he paid on the cross is what you deserve for breaking God's law and offending an infinite being. It all unravels if you start pulling in one thread. By the cross, God demonstrates himself, I say, to be just. In paying for our sins specifically, God is just in letting you walk out of the courtroom and not just walk out of the courtroom, but adopting you and taking you into his own home. He does not harbor an unpunished, guilty criminal. But rather, he harbors a justified son or daughter whose crimes have been fully paid for. That's freedom. So, practically, there's always a very big practical point to deep theology. Practically, when you ask forgiveness, you do not have to wonder if God will forgive or if you sin too much. If he's able to forgive it, there is no sin that you could commit that would be incongruous with, with the penalty that's already been paid. One instant in, uh, of the suffering of God's infinite and perfectly holy Son would be enough to pay for the worst life of sin. This is the freedom of forgiveness that's in Christ Jesus. God has done so much so that you can know that you are justified and so that you really truly can be justified. Jesus says, I lay down my life for the church. I lay down my life for the sheep. If he has laid his life down for you, don't doubt anymore that you're forgiven. And, and, and I hope you see now that, that God is not just loving, but he is just. He is righteous. Uh, he is the just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. So you must see God as friendly toward you. Not just friendly, but magnanimous toward you. In not punishing you for your sins, but punishing Christ for your sins. And you must see God as just. God will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. That's what the Bible says. The gospel is that you are no longer guilty because of what Christ has done. The punishment for the guilty has already taken place in the crucifixion of the righteous Son of God. Blessed indeed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sins. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, your justice is amazing. It is like uh, high and mighty mountains. And Lord, we thank you that we serve not only a loving God, but a just and holy and righteous God who will punish sin and who for us has punished 
sin and has punished our sins in the person and work of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And Lord, how we love you and how we love Jesus who died for us, who endured the awful cross, the wrath of God that we rightly deserve. How we praise you, O oh God, for your rich and loving gift. And we praise you for your justice. And now we pray that you bless us as we come to this table, which is itself an emblem and a sacrament that speaks of the price that was paid for us, the body and blood of Jesus. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.